Right, if we go on to Excel now, as I said, basically, the th- theme that has defined this particular offseason was the pickup of Nuke Doc and the idea that, like, it was Young Buck's choice and he wanted him in the team. And, you know, suppose the other people tried out and it could have been, like, it could have been Chekolad again or it could have been someone else, you know, from the ERL scene. So a lot of fans, a lot of people on Reddit hate this move. Like, they all think, like, Nuke Doc's done. Like, his last splits weren't that great. Obviously, he can't really side lane as much now, which was his specialty but towards the end. And they just basically think he. I I mean, this is their angle, by the way, not mine. They think because he's friends with Young Buck that it's nepotism and you're just picking up your mate, basically. It's like, oh, you're just giving him a chance or whatever, right? Where do you come down on this, Wicked? What do you think of a move like this bringing Nuke Duck in? So, I mean, if you just look at the games, right? If you only look at the facts and nothing else, Nuke Duck is the one shining light on the team. He's been performing extremely well and he's been setting up plays around the map. And he's the only reason I actually think Excel is looking somewhat decent right now. Overall, I think Excel as a team looks terrible. I don't think they're doing very well. And I think they have a lot of issues to fix. But also, one thing to mention, it's only been three games. And one of the games was Cruiser just inting. uh, Dying level one, the Ignite Wukong. And then after that, you can't really do anything. So... I think we need more games to actually see how good they are. What do you think, Amazing? I think they're all teammate from- worth yeah. saying. I, I, I mean, I've been a huge fan of Nuketag ever since I played with him. You know, like I before I played with him, I thought he was. I had the same kind of Reddit <laughs> attitude towards him, but it's also because of some kind of personal, of not not vendetta, but we had like. Um, I remember when he was on Vitality, I kept shit talking uh, him and his jungler Joko. So when they beat us, like he was kind of emoting what it is in our chat, and when we beat them, I was emoting in our chat. So that, right. that was something. Yeah, I kind of had like a weird weird view of him, but when I played with him, I understood like how he views the game, and how he views the game is like he understands that his role. Is obviously I'm supposed to do something individually, but that's not the main. He doesn't see it as the main thing. He doesn't need to individually dominate, and that's not what he pursues. And I think that's where I think he doesn't shine as well as other team, uh, other mid laners, for example, like Caps, who uh, predominantly saw their own like ability in the lane to be the most dominant factor of the play. That's not what Yuktik is about. What he thinks is like obviously I have to lane well, I have to maximize some of my opportunities, but I have to bring my jungler into the fold. And I think that's where. He is a really, really good pickup by Excel, given how holistic and team oriented their approach is. I think that's it's been a really good pickup. Like, it never made sense for them to actually pick up anyone that is a rookie mid laner, given how they think about the game and how Yambach thinks about the game. He needs a veteran force in the mid lane and can have this person facilitate the rest of the map. Like, he likes this. So, I think that new tech acquisition has been like actually a shining light and has been good for them. And I think. They have they have a lot of other other uh, things they have to fix before Nuke Duck is ever going to become the issue for them. That's how I see it. I think mean, I've got a couple of angles on this. So one is like, first of all, one of the things I always used to find weird actually myself was during the era you're talking about, like the Shark Air sort of era, like season seven, season eight, because this type of period for Nuke Dog, because he'd been playing a long, long time at that point in time. I used to just think, ah, oh, he's like an above average mid laner in, you know, EULCSL, LEC, but he's, listen, he's not some monster. And then I would hear all these pro players, though, all these pro mid laners, and they were always praising him. They were always like, oh, he's, he's good. Or I would hear behind the scenes that they thought he was really good. And being Basically, from talking to some of them, it's like what you're saying. They actually basically thought that he was a guy who knew more than just how to play mid lane. Like, he actually understood, like, how to win the game. So then I started looking a bit more, thinking, what do they mean by that? And I would look, and I was thinking, as just a layman, right, because the old Nuke Duck used to really just try and win in CS and just smash the lane, and it was a very greedy player, in my opinion. I thought, right, that's what he was doing when he sidelined. He's just the ego guy, like, right, give it to me. Like, I'm going to go side, I'm going to get this wave. And then what I realized was, if you ever watched, mate, his his timing for when to sideline and when to come back off was fucking unreal. He was one that, like, he was better than most of the other midlanders at that one area. So what I realised was they were thinking, like, listen, maybe I can beat him in this matchup in CS, but if he gets into a position where he can go around the map, like, he's, yeah, he can actually win the game against me. So I think that aspect, I'll just say this, I know sideline doesn't exist in the same way, so that specialty doesn't really apply as much, but the concept that you understand the bigger picture of the game, I agree that's what Excel needed. And I also think this is my other point. I think in league especially people are way too quick to write off legendary players it's one thing if you write off a rookie where they come in they blow it completely they don't show any of their potential they have massive issues maybe you hear like you know in behind the scenes they don't fit that might be a player where who knows if he's going to make it again if you've ever been a legendary player in my opinion you don't write those guys off until it, they've absolutely had the final chance like if there wasn't XL if I was in one of the other teams if I was like an SK or something maybe I would try picking this guy you know what I mean like because I think in, in league especially people don't know how many 
the other factors make you good and bad. It's not like CSGO where you can just be good for like four years straight just because you're that good at the game and you're just not going to drop off. In, C- in League of Legends, obviously, not only does the meta swap, but... Also, what, what are your motivations? Like, remember, when you play in LEC, you have to go and live in fucking Berlin and stay in a team house for all that time. You have to play these long splits. If you do well in the splits, you're playing for months and months and months and months out of the year. Like, when a player's playing as long as Nuke Dog, I could believe maybe, like, he was burned out. Maybe, like, it was the wrong team around. There's a million factors. And I've seen players come back as well. I've seen people who were written off, like, this guy's just done. He's, he's just left for dead. And then they come back, like, two years later and they're pretty good again. So, I, I, I feel like fans, I'm not going to say like he's going to be one of the best but I, I agree he already looks like LEC quality and why fans are always so eager to write off the legendary players I, I feel like it's kind of whack do any of you guys have like an angle on that so, so I think it's all narrative based right and I think Nuketuk is one of the players that's been extremely unlucky and what I mean by that obviously it's not luck based right but there are games where you could have won that game you're most likely to win that game but you end up losing him because of stupid stuff right for example I personally lost to Kaboom didn't feel so good when it happened right and there are those kind of cases and I feel like Nuketuk's career he's just been really unlucky with losing the wrong games and he's actually always been a really good player I played with him before and I know he's really good at shot calling too which is extremely important for a mid laner so overall i think he's a good player and i don't see any reason why he shouldn't be playing yeah but, no, but I, I agree on the on the legendary uh, players or legacy players like being written off too quickly the thing is that that most what most people don't understand like when when rookies nowadays are being picked up they're actually being picked up at the peak that's like it's they're actually not being picked up like for necessarily like um their upside or whatever in, in, yeah. the future, in the future they're actually being being Signed for what they are right now. Like that's actually the thought process behind a lot of the rookie signings. That okay. oh, this guy is really good. We're gonna sign them, uh, sign him right now before anyone else does it. So we can utilize him for one or two years. Hopefully, ride it out. And then when he sucks, we're gonna right. So, but we have this legendary players, like or legacy players, like who have been playing for a long time. Their careers have also like they have peaked to a certain extent, but they that that peak to a certain extent has extended. You know that's why they've been playing for so long. So every, every time they have like a sudden dip in their performance, it's kind of like they get the, like in their brains, the managements or the coaches get the same signal as they get for rookies. Okay, this guy's this guy's done for. We're gonna th- throw him right. out. But that's not how it works. Like you will always have like slight dips, slight dips, slight wins, slight dips, and then at some point like you're gonna be able to peak on the right in the right circumstances. And you just have to replicate those circumstances that people were most successful in in order to create not the dips but the the gains. That's just right. how it works. And I think a lot of teams don't understand this. Uh, Vander, for example, like this guy, every time he had a team that was halfway capable of having any kind of cerebral, like um, any kind of intelligence, right? Intel- a cerebral ability, like he's always been performing well. So like in Springsford, he let's say Springsford would have been summer split of last year, right? He would have been maybe written off because the team only plays seventh. But right now, again, like they're three and zero. And Roki was fucking good. And the year before that, he was he was also like really decent. So I don't know. I don't know what the what people are trying to like gain by just writing out leg- legacy players by having like one or two bad splits, or it's mostly just one. Yes. Because it's it's just one bad split, and they're suddenly written off, and they're like, oh, I guess he's done for. Um, that's actually something that NA doesn't do. Like, I'm I'm surprised that NA is actually better at this at keeping talent. Maybe they're keeping them around for too long and kind of like overstep okay. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Overstep that point. But EU doesn't do this. Like, so is being written off. Like, I mean, Wicked was written off at the time when he was written off. Uh, I was written off after, se- like, surprisingly after season six. I was written off. I was already like, yes. uh, like when I joined Fnatic and we kind of had that sucky sp- start of the split. Yeah. I was written off. Like, how does that even happen? Like, you have one mess split and you're written off so be a bit more realistic about this and understand that create the same opportunities in the same kind of like like surroundings that those legacy players endured at the peak and you will have the same kind of thing happening to you like for sure i think a really big thing is in esports and league of legends esports especially it looks like the grass is always green on the other side and everybody's looking for that right but if you actually look at the pro players that are good they've been around for a long time wunder has been around for seven years People don't even know that, or realize that, right? But he's been around forever. odamna has been around for like seven years or so. Even Adam, who's like a new rookie pickup, he's been around for like two years or something like that in lower leagues. So a lot of the new rookies even have been around for a long time. And it's not like, oh my God, this new talent came out of nowhere and he's right. suddenly playing at the best level. They've actually been around grinding for a long time and achieved what they got throughout a lot of effort. Okay. Right, here's the shit joke, and I even apologize in advance for this one, but I have a rule. If you get a joke, you say it, you just fucking you ride with it. So basically, what Young Buck thought was, it's like me if I'm going to have some snacks and watch a movie. If you want to get a chip, 
That's American slang for championship. You should know that amazing NBA. If you want to get a chip, be sure to buy the dip because, you know, the dip of the thing. Like, it's like buy the dip, you know, from crypto. Crypto, everyone know about crypto? Yeah, it's, it's a thing. Anyway, whatever. Listen, if, it, if you say that it's shit, but then you do it, it's bad. It makes it funny. That's actually the secret to jokes that people don't know. Freak, I could save your whole career, mate. No, anyway, whatever. You get it. Yeah, I'm the line. <laughs> so here's the thing. The other line is this, and I've always loved this line, so I'll apply it with Nuke Duck, because this is also the angle. I totally agree. When they buy these players, first of all, yeah, you're right. They're not buying potential because they've just watched the potential in the RL. Like, they're hoping, yeah, he still evolves more. But by the way, very few players are going to do that because people like Caps, basically, like TCL wasn't what ERLs are now. Like, there wasn't the same level of coaching and scrutiny and stuff. Like they do come into the league and it basically is like becoming a proper pro for the real time. They come in right now, I'm playing. So you can see a player, you know, get three times better in a year or two times. Oh, these players, like, you just have to hope they're as good at the ERL level. Never mind that. Like, never mind being, like, as good as Caps. Like, a lot of them aren't going to be. So I always say this line when people think that, like, raw mechanics beats, like, experience. I always say, like, someone like Nuke Dog has forgotten more about how to play mid lane than some of these rookie mid laners have. Like, they might be able to beat him in solo queue today on a specific matchup. But where are they going to be in two years? Like, what would they do in a certain type of macro game where they had to make a call at some point in time and they have to know, like, am I actually behind in the game? Am I ahead in this game? Like, that's the shit that like experience it's you can take experience to the bank and also yeah let's be real like actually look, look pretty good in these games so okay what about this i have a topic actually to relate to g2 before we get into the team itself which is g2 technically did make a change they added Nelson, who was the guy who was the LNG coach a while ago in LPL, and obviously he's been on a bunch of my shows, me and Dom's shows, and he's a pretty spicy character for someone who's from, like, Asia, you know? He kind of gets, like, you know, Western humour, and he knows also, by the way, that with, especially people like Dom or with, like, Europeans, he can kind of, like, flame people a bit, you know, and it won't be considered BM, which it would be in the, his country. So, basically, this guy's been brought in, and because he's got this, like, public persona, you know, people are loving it, because he's been added as, like, a strategic coach for G2, and always they used to say in G2, even when they had the super team grabs is more the guy which like man managing you know he's like dealing with egos he's dealing with who's in, on their game at the moment who has to sacrifice he never even pretended like i'm a draft genius you know he was doing stuff so a lot of people are hyped like they think this is like the missing piece you know if he comes and he brings this like you know lpl wisdom obviously in theory of all the teams g2 are the team that has the skills to execute something like that a lot of people are kind of hyped they feel like this could put them back on top wicked are you buying it you think the addition of nelson would be legit so this is the only problem I have with it, right? Nelson comes from Asia, or I, he came from China right here in this instance That's he worked in problem. China recently. No, 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 wait, wait. Rough. All right. no, no this is my yeah, yeah. problem. Yeah, so the problem is that people tend to overhype it because, oh my God, he's from China. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. It's the yes. same as the Korean players, right? It's like, it's going to be absolutely amazing. But they don't actually dig deep and see what actually happened there. How did his teams do? Were his teams really good in that region or not? And I like Nelson a lot. I talked to him a bunch. I'm actually very good friends with him. I think his teams didn't really perform super well, and I don't know anything about what he does in G2. So I'm not hyped or anything about it because I just don't have the information. But I feel like a lot of people go out there and like, oh my God, he's going to be amazing. I know nothing about him, but it's going to be the best thing ever. Yes. Thoughts amazing? No, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think I think he has the, the right mentality though for G2. I think he's he wouldn't take anyone's shit, and which is really important on that kind of team because they have so many veterans and so many players that played for such a long time. And I do think at least at least what my prophecy is gonna be. I think it's gonna enable uh, that aggression, like especially that Reckless has kind of lost over like I mean, I, w I won't say he lost it to completely, but he had like certain spurts in the last split where he felt like seemed to be like passive again. You know, he seemed passive again. So I think it kind of will put him in a different mindset, at least in that regard. And it kind of makes up for at least that strategic knowledge. Even any kind of discussion that is going to be forced now and happening is going to have an added voice. And I think that's important given the fact that they lost perks. I think that's actually maybe just the thing that they needed. Someone else that's just actively thinking about the game, just discussing it with them, that may actually like give him a different perspective on the game, how to be more aggressive. But that's that's what I think is going to happen. And at least in, in the Mad Lions game, it kind of showed a bit, but I'm not sure if that's his effect or just the team picking up on the meta. But that's like kind of what I'm what I'm hoping for and what I'm thinking is going to happen. They're going to be slightly more aggressive, not even better, but I think just slightly more aggressive and going to try to make more plays. Want to see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content? Well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.